Hi, my name is uh, Karen Doran. I'm a staff attorney here at LAF, and um, I want to talk with you about um, employment law and how it impacts or affects or comes into play very often um, with our clients who are victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. But before I jump into that, I just want to um, just give a big shout out to Livia for organizing this. I think she's done an amazing job. She's a, 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 a VISTA coordinator who works with us, so yay for her. Thanks a lot for doing this. Yeah. And um, also thank you, too, for, for spending your day with us um, to learn about these various areas. Um, I know it, 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 you guys are busy, and um, this is, a, I hope, um, going to be a really good use of your time. So I, I, am, I don't know if I know how to use this, but we're going to try. Um, okay. Ooh, yeah. So I just did a thing. Okay, good. So... Um, Generally, what I want to do here today is kind of give you guys a, a, a sort of broad overview of, of employment law. Um, and you know what? Just because I, I did a, a little um, uh, work last night with one of our legal clinics and this issue came up, even before I start this, I just want to um, uh, center us um, a little bit more when I talk about employment law so that we're all on the same page as to what I'm talking about. So generally what I tell people is in the employment context, there are really sort of two distinct areas of law. There's what we call employment law, which is what I do, and then what we call labor law, which, which involves um, unions. So I'm not going to be talking at all today about um, unions or, you know, uh, rights that we have under collective bargaining agreements or anything like that. So just sort of bear that in mind. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, the law that affects most of us in the workplace, um, and that's employment law. Okay, when we talk about employment law, um, I like to think about it in terms of, I, I, I have a thing about buckets apparently, but like, you know, putting it in like three different distinct categories or three different um, buckets. So there's uh, discrimination, and retaliation law, and that's your um, uh, standard uh, Title VII, Americans with Disabilities Act, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> then there's um, what we refer to as leave law, and that you can um, think about in terms of, of your rights to take time off from work um, to, to deal with personal matters. Um, and then... Um, the other area is wages, right? Your, your right to be paid, uh, which many employers in this state don't believe you have. So uh, that's generally how, how we think about law. And I don't know who came up with these fancy pants things. I hope it was me, like the transitions. It's really cool. Um, okay, so when we think about discrimination and retaliation law, um, I start from where the law comes from, right? And so generally the law comes from three different distinct areas, federal law, state law, and municipal prohibitions. So um, in each of these different categories, federal law, the, the law that affects everybody in the United States, state law, the law that's, that's um, distinct to each individual state. So obviously um, what I'll be talking about is, is law here in the state of Illinois. And then uh, municipal law, and by that I mean um, it could be county, it could be city, uh, village, that, that sort of stuff. So like for our purposes, um, Cook County uh, is the municipality that we'll, we would most be talking about, or uh, the city of Chicago has um, ordinances prohibiting certain discrimination and retaliation in the workplace. So when we think about discrimination and retaliation, um, there are some um, distinct categories that uh, workers are protected from discrimination from. I think that's bad grammar, but um, at any rate, uh, you've, uh, we are um, protected in the workplace from being discriminated against on the basis of our race, which also includes color, um, our national origin, which can also be considered to be ancestry, um, our age, if we're 40 years or older, which means that if we're under 40, 
or you're under 40, um, you can be discriminated against with abandon. Um, and uh, sex, and sex includes um, a whole lot of, of things, including uh, sexual harassment, we've all heard of that particularly lately, uh, pregnancy, uh, sexual orientation here in our federal circuit. Um, and uh, religion, which includes um, an employer's responsibility to uh, accommodate reasonably, or what we call reasonable accommodation, for our religious practices, and disability, which also includes a reasonable accommodation um, provision. Uh, in Illinois, um, and some municipalities, there are, pro there are additional prohibitions than the ones that I just enumerated, including um, prohibitions against discrimination on the basis of our, of our status of being a victim of domestic violence and sexual assault, which obviously for you guys is really important to know about. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, discrimination on the basis of, of our military discharge status, our housing status, arrest record. You can, you can see it all, all up here. These are all um, gender identity specifically, uh, parental status. These are all um, categories that are not protected um, by the federal government, the, the, the federal uh, laws. So if you live in Mississippi, you're probably... SOL. All right. <laughs> and retaliation. So uh, we talked about employers um, being prohibited from discriminating against us on the basis of certain types of categories, but also the laws prohibit um, uh, employers from retaliating against us for having engaged in protected activity. Um, and so what do I mean by engaging in protected activity? What I mean by that is complaining about unlawful discrimination. So for example, if, if your boss is discriminating against you on the basis of your sex, say, you're, say your boss is, is Harry Weinstein and he's sexually harassing you, and you complain to HR about, um, about sexual harassment, that is protected activity. Um, if you go and you complain uh, about uh, your boss always stealing your lunch, that is not protected activity. Unless he's stealing your lunch because, you know, you're a woman or <laughs> something like that. But good luck proving that. Um, yeah, so, so there's these anti-retaliation provisions to these various and sundry discrimination laws, the federal, state, municipal laws. Um, in addition to the anti-discrimination anti I'm sorry, the retaliation provisions of these anti-discrimination laws, there are um, two specific Illinois laws that protect us um, from retaliation in the workplace. And um, one, of, one of them is the Illinois whistleblower uh, statute. You guys have, may have heard about uh, whistleblowing in, in the workplace. And, um, you know, there's a, it, it, there's a sort of a very narrow protection for, for, for whistleblowing. There's, got, there's a lot of conditions, precedents that have to, to have occurred before you can actually bring such a claim. So under the Illinois whistleblower statute, the written law, um, the complaint has to be made externally. You've got to make it to, like, a federal agency about an OSHA violation, say, for example. Um, and the complaint has to be uh, uh, about something that's illegal or contrary to public policy. So again, it can't just be, my boss is stealing my lunch. Um, you can, uh, you're, you're not going to be protected for, uh, against um, sort of whistleblowing in, in that context. And then Illinois also has a common law tort called retaliatory discharge. Here, um, you don't have to complain to an outside um, agency. It can be just an internal complaint. But again, there's that component about uh, complaining about something that's illegal um, or contrary to public policy. So I hope I'm not getting too, too far in the weeds here uh, for you guys on this. But I just, I, I'm hopeful that I'm kind of giving you an, an, an overview and a good flavor understanding. Mm -hmm. Do we have access to that presentation? Sure, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I'll focus more on listening to you than to Okay. And I do talk fast, so let me know if I should slow down. Um, poor Cynthia's office is right next to me, and so she hears me jibber jabbering all day, and I'm sure it drives me. This is my third cup of coffee, so. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so, so now we're moving on to the leave statutes, and under federal law, there's the Family and Medical Leave Act, and you guys, I'm sure, have all heard about the FMLA. So the FMLA, what it does is it allows us certain employees, if your employer has 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius of where you work, um, and you've worked there for 1,250 hours in a year, <laughs> Um, then you're entitled to leave if you're suffering from what's called a serious health condition, which is pretty broadly defined. Um, so say you, you come down with a terrific cold, right, and you're, you're in bed for, for three days. That's a serious health condition under the FMLA, and so you're allowed to take time off for that. If you have... Uh, you know, conjunctivitis or something like that. That could, that that's probably a serious health condition too. So you can be off of work for for a few days. If you if you have a scratchy throat and you want to just take the day, that's not a serious health condition. Okay. Um, so what the FMLA allows for is um, for up to twelve weeks of unpaid leave, and. Um, you can also, as an employee, request what we refer to as intermittent leave. So intermittent leave is instead of taking one big chunk of time off, you're, you're able to take uh, uh, smaller portions of time off to, hand, to, to deal with certain things. Like, for example, um, it, it, it comes up very frequently in, in our city because of our pollution problems and various and sundry other factors, but where, um, where people have children who suffer from um, severe asthma. And that's the other thing, so, so the serious health condition can be uh, um, of somebody who you care for, like a, a minor child who you care for, a dependent. Um, so if you have a, a kid who's got severe asthma and every now and again she wakes up in the middle of the night, you got to run her over to the emergency room and say you're just cashed and you can't work the following day, you can seek um, intermittent FMLA approval, and that should be approved, and then that means that you could take time off that is the equivalent of 12 weeks over, uh, over, over, over the year. And so when we, um, you know, this, this business here about it being unpaid, is important, right? Because how many of us can take 12 weeks of unpaid leave? Very few of us. Um, so, but, so that's the downside. The sort of upside is that um, I've yet to meet an employer who allows you to take 12 weeks of unpaid leave. The employers usually require that you take your PTO time simultaneously to your FMLA time. And the reason for that is because employers don't want folks to be able to abuse the system and take you know, their, their three months of vacation for recovering from back surgery and then be able to come back and have the audacity to take you know, their, their week vacation. So they make them uh, sort of burn through that, that PTO time um, simultaneously. And the federal law allows for that. Uh, okay, yeah, so, and, and I, did, I did amend this a little bit. So the Americans with Disabilities Act. <sighs> so the ADA has this provision that requires employers to reasonably accommodate us. And um, reasonable accommodation can include, hey Denise, I can do that. No, it's all right. And a reasonable accommodation can, I, I can still say this, can include time off from work. However, in late September, our lovely Seventh Circuit Court, uh, 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 appellate court here, um, recently came down with this decision that says, not so fast. Um, a, 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 a reasonable accommodation of time off is very, very limited. Um, my reading of that opinion is that the Seventh Circuit's opinion is that you can maybe eke out two weeks of of time to be considered reasonable, uh, to to be considered a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. Anything more than that is going to be considered unreasonable. And you know, basically, the the rationale behind it is that in order to be a qualified person, um, a qualified person with a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act, you have to be able to work. And so the Seventh Circuit uh, reasoned that, well, if you can't work, 
uh, for more than two weeks, then you're no longer a qualified person with a disability. And I see you, I see people shaking their heads, yes, and I, I disagree with you. But anyway, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's the state of affairs is in, in terms of the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act as of September 27th or some such thing. Yep, Council? Yeah, can you just clarify in terms of family relationships? I know one of the misconceptions is, for example, caretaking for adult children. Have yeah. different social contexts and define close family relationships differently? Like, which family relationships are covered under that Okay, yeah. Um, I can't answer that off the top of my head because I'm terrible and I should be able to, I should have memorized that. But I'll tell you the reason why is because um, there are uh, these other recent amendments to Illinois law that have uh, changed, you know, they have different definitions. So, so basically, my, my answer without consulting the FMLA right now, my, my answer is going to be anybody who is a dependent on you, except if they're like a, um, uh, a uh, sort of too attenuated familial relationship. So for example, um, under the Americans with, uh, I'm sorry, under the Family Medical Leave Act, if my husband's grandmother was living with us and we were taking care of her, I probably, under the FMLA, would have a hard time arguing that I could take time off to care for her because she suffers from a serious health condition. My husband, no problem, but me because she's essentially, what, a grandmother-in-law? I, it's probably not going to be covered under the under the FMLA. But if you've got like a foster child, or if you've got a, a godson who who lives with you, um, and that's your and he's dependent on you financially, um, the FMLA will cover that. If you're, um, you know, if it's a roommate, no. Uh, but if it's a if it's a partner, then yes. Um, you know, so. The, the statute, the statutory language is actually pretty clear on that, I think. Um, generally, this is now I'm getting into uh, my editorial, but generally I think federal law is better drafted than state law. So the federal law is, I think, pretty well drafted in terms of that. Do you have any, like, specific questions or? I was just thinking in terms of domestic violence survivors. That often I'm sorry, I was thinking in terms of. I was just thinking in terms of domestic violence survivors. Yeah. That often they go stay with their parents, for example. Yeah. So then they would be like the adult child of parents. And yeah. Parents might need time to take care of someone. Who's I see. Parent. I see. That's a really good question. Um, well, uh, yes. Yeah. Under the FMLA, you would, um, uh, the, the parent who's caring for the child who's going through, uh, you know, some mental issues, some, some mental health issues that would rise the level of serious health condition, could then uh, take time off under the FMLA if all these other things are present uh, to care for that person. That's, that's what you're getting at, right? Okay, very good. Yeah, that's my answer, yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Wait. Oop. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, leave of absence law under state law, there's the Illinois Human Rights Act, which, ha which is like the sister statute to the, the federal law, and um, under the IHRA, uh, um, there's this uh, reasonable accommodation provision for people, I think, I think, I don't know, I, I can't remember if it's been amended now, I think they, they still call it handicap, but people with, with a disability. And um, I think the state of the law right now is that uh, under the IHRA, a, a longer period of, of time off can be a reasonable accommodation because, again, that was the Seventh Circuit on the ADA and not doesn't affect um, IHRA. It hasn't been adopted from by our appellate courts. Um, okay, the biggie. This is this is this is the, the the big law that I'm sure all of you guys are are familiar with, and that's the Illinois Victims Economic Security and Safety Act, or what we call VESA. Um, so VESA is I'm not telling you anything you don't know. An incredible law because it's it's. It, it was like the first of its kind. I think there might could be like, I gotta look into this. Might could be like two other 
jurisdictions that have similar laws now, maybe three, I don't know. But, um, but it, the, the Illinois VESA made it illegal for employers to discriminate against us on the basis of our status of being uh, victims of domestic violence or sexual assault, which is to say that prior to 2006, you could be fired for being a victim of domestic violence and that's fine, just like it is in the state of Michigan, for example. Um, so not only did it have the, does it have this anti-discrimination provision and, of course, an anti-retaliation provision, so if you were to, to uh, complain about your treatment, um, complain about being discriminated against on, on that basis, uh, and you were to be terminated for having complaints, then, then your employer could be held liable for, for, for retaliation. But really importantly, what, what VESA does um, is it acts as a leave statute. So in addition to having protections under the FMLA, and many, 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 many people don't because they don't work for employers who employ 50 or more people, um, the uh, VESA affects everybody now. It's been amended recently, and I uh, put that down now, in, in the summer the amendment went into place, where now everybody who works for an employer in the state of Illinois is covered by VESA. Um, so, so you can take up to 12 weeks of, of time off, and it depends on the size of your employer. And I, I was so good, and I put down like you know four weeks if you're if you're employed by an employer who uh, employed by an employer who employs uh, one to 14 people, uh, eight weeks, 15 to 49, and 12 weeks for 50 plus, um, and the the type of or the rationale for the leave just needs to be related to the abuse. Um, it could be that you need to take time off in order to find housing. It could be that you need to take time off in order to put into place a safety plan. It could be that you need to take time off in order to go to a doctor or to go to court. Um, it could be that you need to take time off because it's your daughter that's the victim of sexual assault and you need to care for her. Um, so, so VESA is around for us um, to, to and, and, you know, gives us those protections in addition to the FMLA, right? So, so that's, that's kind of nice. Um, the downside to VESA is that it has limited remedies, but that's true for the FMLA too. Um, and the other downside to VESA is that um, you don't have a, 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 a right to sue in court, so you got to go through the Illinois Department of Labor or the IDOL. But the upside to that is that it's faster, it's free, and there's dedicated uh, staff at the IDOL who handles VESA claims, and, and, and for, for my dollar, they're, they're, they're pretty great um, for the time being. So, so that's good. Um, we have a new law in Illinois um, that provides for leave um, uh, for, for it, it allows us to take time off for sick leave um, when our dependents are sick, if the employer has already has a sick leave policy in place, which is whatever. That, that's, again, that gets a little weedy there, but that's, that's a new policy. That's kind of cool. Um, and that could come into play, obviously, for, for our clients whose kids are victims. Um, and then the then there's something called the Illinois Child Bereavement Leave, uh, which is also a new law, and that um, that allows for time off people having time off to grieve the loss of of a of a of a child. Um, and there's even provisions in there about multiple children loss of multiple children, and ugh. so. But this is really this is shockingly new. Uh, I actually have a case. Uh, from a few years back prior to the enactment of this law where my, my client was fired by McDonald's for having the gall to uh, call in sick because his infant son died. Um, yeah, bad news.
but now don't have to worry about that. But notice employers with at least 50 employees. That's kind of shitty, right? All right. I mean, darn. <laughs> oh, God, it's terrible. So sorry. Um, okay. Uh, leaves of absence. Um, uh, we, we also get uh, laws uh, um, at the municipal level, the county level, uh, for, for sick leave. God, I'm saying that crazy. But at any rate, here in Cook County, starting in, in this past summer, uh, we, we get to have time off for being sick, which I think also kind of shocks a lot of people. Like, there are loads of employers who will fire you because you take time. Well, okay. You guys are all like, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so maybe it isn't so shocking. But yeah, so, um, so here, at least in Cook County, employers can't do that anymore. Um, you know, there are some provisions, some conditions preceding. You got to work a certain amount of time and, and things like that. But this is this is a this is a really great great law. And again, this is taking leave off for for your own illness and also also for for family members. So these are types of things that do come into play for victims of sexual assault and domestic violence because we have so many needs, right? You know, you got to you you. You're, you're hurt, you gotta go to the hospital, you've gotta go to the doctor, you've got you know, PTSD and you've got mental health issues that have to be dealt with and all of these come into, come into play and are covered by these various leave laws. All right, and so another thing that we see a lot of, and the reason why I'm, I, I wanna go into sort of more detail uh, about this with you guys is, um, Cynthia, I have like a half an hour, right? Is that right? You have until 10 after. Okay, all right. Um, we can give people an extra five minute break. I could do that because I feel like I'm talking really fast. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk about the wage laws because many of our clients are low wage earners, and low wage earners <laughs> tend to be the most vulnerable when it comes to wage laws where um, not only are we not getting paid a whole heck of a lot, but we're very often um, not, you know, we're, we're getting uh, deductions, illegal deductions taken from our checks. And we're also, this happens so often, uh, where we don't get our last check. So, um, so that's where uh, federal and state wage laws come into play. So just uh, taking a step back, let's all recognize uh, what the minimum wage is in the state of Illinois. It's a paltry $8.75 an hour, which is higher than the federal minimum wage. So I want to say it's like seven twenty-five. dollars if anyone knows. Uh, so um, it's eight seventy-five dollars the entire for the entire state. For the county of Cook, the minimum wage is now $10 an hour. It, was, it rose this summer. And then in, in the city of Chicago, the minimum wage is $11 an hour. And I assume that maybe all you guys have heard about these, um, these the minimum wage going up in certain jurisdictions. Um, and so for the city of Chicago, there's like a step plan to bring it all the way up to, I think it's $13 an hour over time. And for Cook County, they've adopted the same thing, but they're just a, like a year behind uh, um, the city of Chicago. So, so, so there is that. So bear that in mind. I mean, and, and very often, employers will play fast and lose. Well, I didn't know. I didn't think I was... I, would, I had to do it because I don't make $250,000 and crazy, crazy arguments that they come up with. But just bear in mind that if your client works in the city of Chicago, she's entitled to, to $11 an hour. If she's working just in Cook County, not the city of Chicago, she's entitled to 10 Everybody else is only entitled to $875. Um, okay, so uh, when we think about wage law, I'd like to think about it in terms of uh, minimum wage and overtime law, and then laws about actually getting my paycheck, getting paid. So, um, so in addition to the minimum wage, there are overtime laws, both federal and state, that require employers to pay us time and a half for time worked over 40 hours in a week, uh, which oftentimes, again, gets played very fast and loose, particularly by 
you know, employers like Walmart, for example, <laughs> that comes up a lot. Um, so, so you know, just bear in mind that that there there is this overtime law. Very often, employers will, particularly for very vulnerable workers, will uh, sort of require them to sort of clock out and continue to work, um, or never clock in and clock out. They just don't track their hours. And they pay them like a set 40 hour a week, but they're really working 50 hours a week. Stuff like that. Fun stuff like that. Um, let me see. I didn't even go into, yeah. So, ah, there it is. Okay, so the Illinois Wage Payment and Collections Act is the law that requires. I mean, that's the law that we use to enforce employers paying their employees. So what the IWPCA says is that um, you are entitled to all of your pay, either at the time that you're terminated or at least by the next regular pay period, which this is what gets blown out of the water very, very often. Um, you know, I've got a client right now that um, he, was, uh, he was terminated on like a Tuesday. His next pay period was a Friday. He spoke with his uh, employer um, like on that Wednesday or Thursday or something and said, said hey, um, I, I don't want to come in and get my check. Who would? Uh, you know, send it to me. And she said, yeah, 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 no problem, I'll do that. And, um, and then, of course, never came. So he called and says, hey, where's my check? And she says, what? Checks in the mail. And uh, never came. And so, um, so now he's, he's out his final paycheck, uh, which actually is, is pretty big because it, it was one of those deals where you don't get paid for like three weeks. So he, yeah, so there's that. And, and um, you know, that happens a lot, but it happens, like I said, to, to low-wage earners because... Um, there's really only two things that you can do about it. You can um, you can file a complaint with the Illinois Department of Labor, and uh, but you have to do that within uh, within one year of the of the of the non-payment, and then you're queued up. I mean, IDOL's got thousands of these cases um, that they adjudicate all the time, and, and employers know this, and they don't really care. And so very often, employers never show up. And so then you go through the hearing, and it takes maybe a year before you actually get the hearing. And hand to God, even after like the other party doesn't show up, it takes like five months for the judge to to issue a ruling on it. But I understand they're busy. So, um, <laughs> but then once you get the ruling, that and fifty cents to buy a cup of coffee because the employer is like, what are you what are you going to do with that? So then you got to either file a a, a complaint in, in circuit court. Um, to get an actual judgment, or you got to hope that the attorney general's office will do it on your behalf, which they only do for a certain, a small portion of those cases, because again, there are just thousands of these cases that are filed. So that's the state of things. Um, and then you got to go through collections, and like, but, um, and that's what employers are, are banking on. I mean, there are millions of dollars that are not paid out uh, by, by these employers because they know that they ultimately are never going to have to pay it. Or if they do, they'll only have to pay a portion of it. Or even then, you know, the state may negotiate with them and say, okay, we'll give like $10 a month towards this. So it's bad news. But we do handle those cases. I'm like Debbie Downer today. Okay, so the other area that we work in is um, unemployment. So let's talk about that uh, briefly too. Um, very many of our uh, of our clients uh, have either been terminated or they had to quit for a variety of reasons. They have to move to a different area. They have, um, you know, they've they've uh, they don't feel safe because um, the the bad actor knows where they work and they may have followed them there. They may actually work with the bad actor, and they no longer work, want to work there. Um, you know, a, a variety of things. Or their their doctor may have said, "This is way you you know you are way too stressed out right now. You're on the brink. You you can't work um, for for a period of time." All right. So unemployment law. 
Um, right now, when we are separated from our employment, uh, we um, can be entitled to up to 26 weeks or six months of, of unemployment benefits. Unemployment benefits um, are only a portion of what our sort of calculated average salary was for the, for the last employer or last employment period. Um, it's 60%, plus we get um, an allowance for dependents. So it's not, it's, it's not perfect, but certainly it, it's better than nothing. Um, I want to talk about something else that, that's not up there, because this, this comes up, and, and, and I don't, I would love to, to get this out of our collective thinking. Um, and that is the idea that unemployment is somehow a handout, somehow something that, you know, well, gee, I'm going to really try not to get it. You know, it's, 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 it is something that we have paid into. It is something that we have earned. Um, you know, our pay, you know, the employers get uh, taxed by the state to pay into the kitty, and they have these premiums for unemployment, and that's reflected in our salaries, in our wages, and um, you know, unemployment is is not. It's all it is is it's meant as a bridge between one job to another job, and it keeps us off the streets essentially. So um, I don't know if you guys have experienced talking to clients who have lost their jobs and sort of are reticent to, to apply for unemployment, but if I can leave you with one thing today to think about in terms of, of employment law, it is tell your clients to apply. I don't care why they were fired or why they quit, tell them to apply. Um, let's get the ball rolling on that. Okay, so how do you become eligible? Um, you are eligible for unemployment benefits if you were not fired for what the um, statute defines to be misconduct. Misconduct is not what we normally think of as mis misconduct. I mean, misconduct in the normal parlance is often, you know, uh, you're, you, were, you were late or you weren't real nice to your coworker or, you know, something, something like that. Um, or you're, you didn't iron your uniform or, you know, something like that. Under the statute, misconduct is very strictly defined um, to, to mean that um, you have violated a rule that you knew about and, and it was a reasonable rule and the rule related to the job that you were doing and that in violating that rule, you have harmed your employer. And usually when we think of harm, we think of money. It's cost your employer some, some cash. Um, or you, were, you did this in the past. You violated this reasonable known rule in the past. And you were warned by your employer not to do it again. And you did it again. So, so that's misconduct. Um, and it's always the employer's burden to prove misconduct. Um, so that's one, one way to be eligible, not to be fired for misconduct. And then the other way is that you did not quit. Generally, generally, if you quit a job, you're not entitled to unemployment benefits. Because the, the idea is that unemployment is only there for folks who have um, been sort of separated from their employment through no fault of their own. And so if you quit the default position that IDES takes, our Illinois Department of Employment Security takes, is that uh, you, it, it's your fault. You know, you, you're, um, you, you made this happen, and so therefore you got a, you made your bad guess sleep in it. All right, so, um, but there are, there are a number of exceptions to the voluntary quit doctrine, and that is, um, includes, for purposes of what we're talking about here today, it includes um, two major exceptions, and one of them is that uh, if you were a victim of sexual assault, or rather sexual harassment, sorry, sexual harassment in the workplace, and that's why you're quitting, that is an okay reason to quit. Um, and if you are a victim of domestic violence and the domestic violence is impacting your ability to work, that's another good reason to quit and you're, you're entitled to benefits. Um, another is um, 
another eligibility requirement is that you are able to work and available to work. So that means that you know you can you can physically work. You're you're so remember I, I, I gave you sort of a I quickly mentioned, oh, what if your doctor says to you, you know, you're in no state to work, I gotta take you off of work. Um, that may be an okay reason to resign because that's another exception if you have a doctor's note um, and you show it to your employer before you quit. Um, but if, if, you, if your doctor has taken you off of all work, then you're not eligible to work. You know, rather, I'm sorry, you're not able to work, right? So you're not going to get unemployment benefits. You may be eligible for disability benefits maybe. I don't know. I don't, know, I don't do public benefits. My gut tells me it's going to be real hard, but um, but you because you're not able to work, you're not going to get paid benefits from IDES. Now, if your employer takes you, says you can't work there because it's so stressful, it's the environment that something terrible happened to you and you're still in it, that sort of a thing, then that's a different story. Then, okay, I just can't work there, but I'm going to apply for jobs elsewhere. And that, that, that would make you um, able to work. And then available to work is just this, this uh, business about um, hoofing it, getting out on the street and, and, and making sure that you're applying for jobs. Yeah? How does the able and available to work part relate to if you um, quit because of domestic violence? Do you have to show that there's been a change in your circumstances and that you are now able and available to work? So, so, so able and available to work has more to do with after you've separated from the job and your ability to get a new job. That's, that's what it's focused on. So um, it doesn't, if, if you quit, and I'm, I'm not sure, for it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what I understand you, you to be saying is that the reason why you quit is because of the uh, domestic violence. So for example, just get a little bit more facts in there. Let's say that your, um, your spouse knows where you work and uh, you've moved and you're, you, you need to stay away from it. That's part of your safety plan is, is, to, is, to, is, to, is to not be where he thinks you are. And so that's one of the reasons why you decide to, to, to leave this job. That's not going to impact whether or not you're able to work for another employer, right? But say it's not that, like, <coughs> cut and dry of a okay. scenario. Say, uh -huh. say you, you aren't relocating, maybe you aren't even leaving your abuser, uh -huh. um, but you still had to quit your job at that point. Okay. And you need the benefits because you want some financial independence. Sure. But you also have to show that you're able and available, but maybe still with your abuser. Like so, the the question would be, why did you quit the job? Yeah. So, uh, um, if you, I, I can't think of a, of a off the top of my head, I can't think of like a fact scenario where, uh, you know, where, where where that sort of works. If if you if you can't if you quit because you can't work because you you need time off to 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 develop a plan or to you know so, something else, then then IDES is going to stick the able and available provision to you, and you're not going to get benefits because what able and available is is all IDES wants. Well, not all IDES wants you to to be looking for another job. That's what they want, and so if you quit and you don't intend to look for another job and you in fact don't look for another job, then you're not making yourself available to work. Yeah. Can I suggest on this question that maybe this is where VESA and unemployment intersect mm -hmm. and that if your clients are thinking about quitting their job because they can't deal with their situation, they're stressed out, um, feeling sick. Um, that they may be uh, advised about their VESA rights and that they can take time away from work without having to quit their job. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the beauty of the VESA law, that if um, more survivors knew that they could just take some time, even intermittent time, to see a therapist or whatever, or take a few weeks off, they can still retain their job. That, I think, is the key between the, the intersection of these laws. That's a great Coming point. Off. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that would be 
marvelous advice if someone just needs to take some time off in order to to um, handle the situation, the sort of acute problems that they're dealing with, right, then, then that's what PRESS is there for. Um, also, don't forget about the FMLA. If, you're, if, if you have a doctor's note that says that you're now suffering from a serious health condition and that's mental distress or something like that. Yeah, so um, our clients who come in under these grants, um, what I see as their typical employment law related issues <coughs> are, um, or to be our uh, sexual harassment, because very often the, the, the sexual assault um, is, stems from the employment relationship. Um, and in the employment law context, Sexual assault is understood as sexual harassment, um, generally. So, uh, so they come in with sexual harassment issues. They come in with uh, VESA or FMLA leave issues. They come in uh, with unpaid wages issues. Um, you know, think about that. Just to put that in a little bit more context. I mean, that's that's your scenario where you quit the job sort of suddenly, and your employer's pissed. So they're going to take it out on you by not paying you your last check, which I think is what happened to my client. Um, and then unemployment benefits, you know, trying to win those, those unemployment benefits. Um, what's that? Can they get away with it? Can they get away with not paying you? No. That's why we have, like, the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act. But with the caveat that justice is slow. <laughs> And, um, you know, if you don't go, I, I think I sort of truncated that commentary about the IWPCA where I talked about, you know, one of the avenues is to go through the IDOL, which can be a very long and drawn out uh, um, process. The other way is just simply go straight into court and, and sue them directly. Um, but then again, you're probably going to be faced with the same sort of issues. First of all, it's going to cost you money to file a lawsuit. Not a whole heck of a lot, but... But yeah, I mean, for someone who doesn't have any money, it's always a lot. And, um, and then, of course, it's better to have a lawyer if you're going to be in, in court because they need to understand the procedures and the substantive area of the law, whereas at DOL, you don't really. So, um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, you, you, could, you could press the matter by doing one of those two things, but very often, again, because employers, uh, you know, we, we don't really have... A, a lot of money that our government puts in to regulate this stuff and to, and to ensure that employers do pay us on time and what we're owed. Um, so what that results in, I think, is that employers uh, very often feel empowered to, to withhold monies um, knowing that ultimately they're either never going to get, never going to have to pay it, or if there is a judgment, who cares? Um, you know, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to prevent me from getting a contract. It's not going to prevent me from, uh, from, from hiring other people or from, you know, whatever. So just, just so you know, there, there are other jurisdictions that have come up with different, um, I feel, I, <laughs> I hope I'm not going to get onto like the legislative part of this, but um, there are other jurisdictions that have come up with ideas uh, to 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 handle that, and one of the one of the ideas that I like is this sort of like list of of published employ like a list of, of that's published of employers who have who have been found to have stolen wages from their employees, and so that's I think a really sort of powerful or can be a very powerful tool, um, you know, to know about. We don't have that. Okay, and so I just want to uh, finish up with um, with a with a, uh, a case um, that I have that is a pretty typical um, typical kind of case uh, that involves uh, victims of domestic violence, sexual assault. Okay, so um, my client, I'm going to call her Tony. Um, Tony has a really sad um, case. So she was dating this character for, for a bit, and um, not that long. 
and um, it, you know, it wasn't taken. She wasn't really into him, so she she broke up with him. Um, and shortly thereafter, he kidnapped her and took her for about forty eight hours and um, abused her. And she was able to escape, and she went to the police, and the police um, sent it to the state attorney who prosecuted the guy, if you can believe it. So uh, this guy, and also, just so you know, Tony's got, a, Tony's got a daughter, a young, dependent daughter. I mean, so this is a really bad situation. And she's obviously very, very traumatized by the situation. Well, uh, after, you know, I want to say, did I, did I put it there? Yeah, months. It was months. So months, months later, she starts a new job, a really good job, a nice paying job uh, in, a, in a great environment, really good benefits. Uh, she starts this new job, and about a month after she started the job, she gets a call from the Cook County Sheriff saying, we're going to subpoena you to testify against... The, the, the kidnapper um, at 26th Street, they called her on like a Thursday, we're going to need you to testify on Monday. And so uh, she understandably was very anxious and, and uh, worried and um, so she, she started to cry and her boss uh, and she went into a conference room and she talked about it. And she divulged to her boss what had happened to her and that she was going to have to testify. And she was very nervous. And, and she's going to need to take some time off on Monday in order to testify. And actually, um, she was gonna, the, the sheriff was going to drive out to where she was. And, um, and they were going to have lunch. And that's when she was going to get the subpoena. So, and, and that actually happened. So boss was very cool and said, oh, you know, gee, that's, that's a really horrible story. Don't you worry about it. Um, go ahead and, you know, you can certainly take, take that time off to testify against this jerk. Um, she, but she said, just send an email to the other boss um, letting, letting her know, and I'll let her know too. I'll talk to her about what we, what we discussed. So she says, sure. So my client emails her other boss, and she says, um, you know, I've got to testify at this, um, at this trial on Monday, and, um, you know, I, I suspect that, it, you know, I'm only going to be gone in the morning. So I should be able to come back for my shift. She's a good girl. So, um, so she goes to 26th Street on that Monday. And you can't bring your phones in there. And um, she's there at, like, 8.45 in the morning. And the state's attorney puts her in, in a witness room and doesn't let her leave no access to a phone, and um, around 11 o'clock, she starts getting a little bit anxious about having to go back to work, and she says, you know, gee, I'd, I'd like to call my employer to let them know what's happening, and the state's attorney says, no, I can't let you talk to anybody. She goes, but um, don't worry about it. I'll give you a letter, and it'll be fine. She says, okay, okay. So she ends up not testifying until very late in the afternoon. And so when she's done, it's around 4.45 or so, she goes back to her car and there are messages on her cell phone from the director of this place where she's working. I mean, she is, let me, let me just make it very clear to you, nowhere near <laughs> the, the, the director. A director is not her direct boss or anything like that. She gets this call from, from the director saying something along the lines of, you know, uh, you need to be a little bit more responsible about your work schedule, and we expected you in this afternoon, and what's going on? Yeah, you like that? So she calls immediately and says, oh, gee whiz, this is what happened. Let me, you know, I've only just been out from testifying. And the director is still like, mm, yeah, but you said, you know, we expected you back here this afternoon. And so, um, so the next day, she brings her letter from the prosecutor, but mm, the director and her boss fire her. And they fire her because she had the audacity not to come into her job answering phones in the afternoon. So, um, so we, we got her um, through one of our partner agencies 
And uh, we helped her file a complaint with the Illinois Department of Labor under VESA. It's a pretty clear, I mean, who, seriously, it's really, it's a pretty clear cut case. Um, so we filed a, a complaint with the um, Illinois De, uh, Department of, of Labor um, because, as, as, you, as I'm sure you know, VESA uh, allows you to take the one day off to go uh, uh, testify against, against your, your abuser. Um, and so, and she had given them the certifying document and, and all that good stuff, so that's not even an issue. Uh, DOL investigates and finds in our client's favor, and so she's sort of faced with the possibility of filing a, a lawsuit at DOL, which she does. And so now that's 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 currently um, pending. Uh, we're 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 waiting. We're hopeful that we'll be able to settle this for for the client, but um, but that's that's what's happening here. And one of the things that we were able to do because we've got a really fantastic. <coughs> Client Support Services Unit, headed up by a really great um, social worker. She was able to help my client transition from one housing, uh, subsidized housing to another because the guy knew where she lived before. Um, and she had issues with an old ComEd bill and how she couldn't get, uh, get her, her uh, ComEd up and running in the new place. But again, our social worker was, was able to help her get a grant to, to handle that. And, um, and uh, also, she was able to get her some public benefits, too. So, you know, that's what we do here. That's it. Yeah? What are some outcomes that you're looking um, to get out of? Out of this particular yeah. case? Yeah, so what, what I'd love to get for her is, is a pretty nice lump sum payment sooner rather than later so that she can feel real secure about um, you know protecting herself and protecting her daughter because this guy's getting out he's getting out probably in 2019 I think so she's nervous about that understandably and she's in a very precarious situation she still hasn't been able to find other work she's definitely uh, suffering from from uh, mental distress um, and you can imagine how, uh, just so you know, I'm not going to tell you who, who the employer is, but, uh, but just so you know, the employer is a health care provider. So that's just really gross, right? It's really gross. Um, so yeah, so that's my, my, my goal for her in terms of her employment case is to get her, get her some nice cash.